Good morning. Glad to see you here. I think we're going to have a great program today. Uh, let me introduce our speaker. Um, his name is uh, Mike Michael Searles, but uh, we'll call him Cowboy Mike. <laughs> if you were at the last Vision Series program, which I presented, uh, our president, Dr. Bomer, uh, showed you a picture of me back in the Old West. <laughs> <laughs> on my Shetland pony, and uh, even then, uh, I was following the Wild Bill Hickok injunction on TV of, of carrying my guns, you know, butt first, not, uh, not the other way around. I could get a quicker draw that way. Uh, but anyway, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Professor Searles. Uh, he is, uh, his longest tenure of teaching was at uh, Augusta State University. I will not, I will not use the grew word here. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, he got his bad BA in history from Southern Illinois uh, University, so that means you're a Saluki, right? Yes, he uh, got his MA uh, in history from Harvard University in Washington, D.C. Howard. Howard, I'm sorry. Sorry, Howard University. Uh, and, uh, and actually uh, did Ph.D. studies at uh, Union Institute and University of Cincinnati, Ohio. He has taught in the Richmond County Public Schools. He's taught Georgia Military College. He's taught Boggs Academy, which I found very interesting. University of the District of Columbia, but uh, he spent uh, 20 years at Augusta uh, State University. Um, he has a, um, a book publication uh, he co-authored with Bruce uh, Glassrude called Buffalo Soldiers in the West, a Black Soldiers Anthology. Uh, he's written articles for, for other books, um, and he's an authority on uh, uh, African Americans in the American West. So at this point, let's give a hand for uh, Cowboy Mike. Okay, it's a, it's a pleasure being here. I was uh, talking to uh, the president's secretary and she said, uh, you were here a long time ago. And I said, yeah, I think I was quite a few years ago uh, here at, uh, on campus. But what a beautiful campus you have. I understand you even have a, some sort of a basketball team as well. Uh, and that's, that's great. Well, it is a special pleasure to be here and to be a part of the Vision Series. Uh, and, you know, you might ask the question, uh, why uh, did they invite an old cowboy to talk about vision um, or to be a part of the vision series? But uh, as I go through the lecture and presentation today, I hope you'll begin to see a connection uh, in terms of the Old West and the Black West and, uh, again, that, uh, uh, and that aspect of the of, uh, vision. Let's see now if I am if I'm on target. No, nope, that's not the right thing. Let's see here. Oh, let's go back there. Okay, that's fine. I'm going to talk a bit about the Black West. I'm going to talk a bit about uh, my interest in the Black West. You know, when I was growing up, when I was a youngster, and I used to go to see movies and things like that, uh, and that was a long time ago, I never saw a single black cowboy. And if you'd asked me, uh, about black cowboys, I would have uh, been sort of, I think, sort of puzzled because I never saw him on the silver screen. Uh, I saw Gene Autry, I saw Roy Rogers, I saw Lash LaRue, I saw a number of cowboys on there, but never any black cowboys. It wasn't until many years later that I discovered that there were black cowboys, uh, that, uh, uh, that was a tradition of black cowboys, uh, but that was, again, many years later. But I grew up in a community, or I grew up, again, at a time when cowboys were very much in fashion. And so, like, uh, I guess, uh, Dr. Dorton and I wore my six shooters and all those kind of things when I was a youngster, but much later before I began to connect the African-American experience with black cowboys. That, learning about that, did something kind of interesting. After having made hundreds or maybe even thousands of presentations on black cowboys, I was contacted by Sarah Massey uh, she's the editor of Black Cowboys of Texas. And she asked me if I would do a chapter, would I be like willing to do a chapter on Black Cowboys because she'd been uh, really, uh, the uh, T Texas University, uh, Texas A&M University Press had contacted her with the idea of doing a book on Black Cowboys and so she began to call around and ask various folks 
uh, who would be a good person to write, and somewhere along the line, someone recommended me. When, I, when she first contacted me, I had immediately someone in mind. It was a black cowboy that, if you looked up in the record, you only found several reference to him as old ad, black ad, or a word that now has become a pejorative anyway, nigger ad. That's how he was known. No last name, just ad. And so he was an interesting figure in, uh, in the West. He's one of those black cowboys that in many cases were just part of the landscape and not recognized, except in his own community where he became quite a notable cowboy. I'll tell you one story about Ed and I'll go on and talk about some other things too. Uh, one of the things that he could do was tie a lasso around his waist hard and fast. Tied hard and fast. And then he'd go into a corral and he'd let a horse go uh, up to full gallop. He would lasso that horse and then snatch it off its feet with just that single motion. Now you figure a horse running maybe 30 miles an hour, you throw a lasso around his neck and you've got the rope tied around your waist, just what could happen? Unless you had perfect timing and extraordinary strength, suddenly you're gonna be dragged quite a bit. Well, he did that quite a bit. Well, anyway, I did a story, I did, I did a chapter on Addison Jones. I found his last name, by the way, Addison Jones. And that's how I, again, had a chance to contribute to, again, Black Cowboys of Texas. Because the book was successful, it won a number of awards, uh, it was very well received, et cetera. Uh, a friend of mine, Bruce, uh, Bruce Glassroot, we got together and we pitched an idea uh, to uh, Texas A.M. University Press, and that was a book on Buffalo Soldiers. Uh, they liked the idea, and of course, if anybody that's involved in writing a book knows that it goes through a long process. There are people that they will send books out to to, to uh, evaluate the book, et cetera, make suggestions. But eventually, this became the product, Buffalo Soldiers in the West. I'll talk about Buffalo Soldiers a little bit later on. And also, again, I've also had the opportunity as well to uh, contribute to another book, again, called uh, The African American Experience in the in Texas, an anthology as well. So that's what really got me involved in basically writing about black cowboys uh, and got me interested in cowboys in, in, in particular. Now I'm gonna just share some images with you of various uh, folks. Uh, let's see here. Let's try this fellow here. This is a mountain man. His name is Jim Beckworth. To be a mountain man was quite something it's estimated that if 100 mountain men went out into the wilderness to trap, trap animals for furs, et cetera, that at the end of the season, only about 20 returned. That means 80 of the, of the mountain men that went out there did not return to rendezvous. Now, that could be for a variety of reasons. In some cases, they were killed. Uh, in some cases, they were mauled by animals. They might have been killed by Indians or any kind of accident. Some may have joined in with the Indians and not returned. But Jim Beckworth was one of those mountain men, born a slave uh, again, and moves out his, his slave father and slave family, moves out to Missouri, gains his freedom, uh, and loved adventure. And again, when the, the uh, Ashby Fur Company, one of their, a couple of major fur companies uh, that were involved in selling uh, these various kinds of uh, beaver furs, et cetera, uh, and they were very popular in Europe and in the United States, they come by Missouri looking for men that wanted to uh, uh, live a life of adventure, and Jim Beckworth was one of those individuals who wanted to live that kind of life. So he travels out to the west. Uh, he travels out there with other mountain men, but has an experience out there that was kind of interesting and probably somewhat unique, not completely, but he was taken in by the Indians. Uh, and some people assumed he was going to be killed by the Indians, uh, but he was adopted into the family. Um, Jim Beckworth, again, and this was not an extraordinary event. In other words, if you were a young child, it happened to children, it happened to adults as well, but they were adopted into Indian families. Uh, if you were traveling on a wagon train, let's say, and your family family was going out to Oregon, which would be a good place to go, right? Okay, out to Oregon, let's say, uh, and you're not riding in the wagon, you're not riding in the wagon, you're all walking alongside, and you've got two or three kids. Well, you might travel, let's say, for so many miles and look around and find one of your kids were missing. Oh my goodness, where's Johnny? Johnny has wandered off somewhere along the trail uh, and you can't turn the wagon train around. 
You can't go back and look for him. He's just lost. Sometimes kids in that situation, other situations were adopted by Indians. Jim Beckwith, as a grown man, was adopted by the Indians. And when he was adopted by the Crow Indians, what he did is he began to live the life of a Crow as a young man in a Crow community would do. In other words, he became a hunter, he became a fighter, uh, a warrior. He did all the kinds of things that other young Crow men would do to such an extent that eventually he becomes a chief among the Crow Indians. This is a very resourceful man, Jim Beckworth. And you had to be. You had to be to survive. Uh, he lived with the Indians for a while, but he also did all kinds of things. He was a scout. At various times, he's an army scout. He does something quite interesting, too, is that he finds an area within the Sierra Nevadas where he thought would be a good area for a wagon train to pass through. He helped to improve that area and created a pass that still bears his name today. It's called Beckworth Pass. There's a town called Beckworth, named for Jim Beckworth. Uh, again, uh, interesting, extraordinary man. Lived a long life, interesting life, again. One able to adapt to the new situations, uh, which he did very effectively uh, throughout his life. Uh, sometimes he's involved in running a hotel, or other times he's involved in horse trading, or he just does a lot of different kinds of things. And so it's, it was interesting enough character that during his lifetime, someone wrote his biography. In fact, he dictated his biography to a, to a writer, the man T.D. Bonner, who wrote a biography of Jim Beckworth while he was still alive. Uh, Beckworth is one of those interesting figures in the American West that, again, uh, again is uh, noteworthy. This is, probably an, a, this is probably the iconic image of a black cowboy. You'll see that image in many, many different places. And it's the image of a black man by the name of Nate Love, Nat Love. And Nat Love was born a slave. Um, most sort, he, he said in Tennessee, some places you'll read, they'll say, they'll say Kentucky, but uh, he said Tennessee in his own autobiography, the only 19th century, 18th century, 19th century cowboy to write his own, uh, again, own 20th century cowboy to write his own biography, Nat Love. Nat Love was born a slave, uh, learns to ride wild horses while he was a slave, uh, and then after slavery is over, he goes out to a place called Dodge City. Uh, Dodge City, Kansas, which still exists today and is still a place where you find cattle and things. And when I was in Dodge City, I was kind of struck. Was, as I got closer to Dodge City, Kansas, I could smell the cattle. So, wow, my goodness. And there, there, are cow, there are cattle pens all around, uh, again, Dodge City. Uh, in, the old, in the West, unlike in the East and places like that, cattle is basically grows up on the range eating grass, but when it's time to be marketed, they bring it to cow, these cow pens. And then they go through a process of being fed different grains until they're suitable to take to market. Well, a lot of cow pens around Dodge City. And when I got there, the main street had brewery, uh, uh, breweries and, and cow pens, et cetera. And just kind of reminded me that probably Dodge City hadn't changed very much in all those years. But Nat Love goes to Dodge City. He's looking for a job. He wants to be a cowboy. He sees a herd of cattle coming to Dodge City. Uh, and he goes out and he talks to the trail boss. And he says, I want to be a cowboy. And the trail boss said, well, what can you do? He said, well, I can ride wild horses, which, of course, he could. When, a cow, when cattle was being driven into a town, and you had, a, you had, let's say, 8, 10, maybe 10, 11, 12 cowboys driving the cattle in, they always had, again, maybe as many as 75, 100 or more horses with them because the cowboy didn't use the same horse all the time. He'd ride a horse for a couple hours, trade off, get a fresh horse, and during the day, he would use maybe six or so horses. But the horses that they traveled in the Remuda were sometimes greenbroke, which was a term that was used. Greenbroke basically meant that they were just, uh, had been ridden a few times, or not ridden very much at all, and they were pretty wild. So when that love says that he can ride wild horses, the trail boss said, well, I think I've got a horse I'd like to see you ride. And you can just imagine the kind of horse that was. Uh, in fact, it was a horse that was, again, very hard to ride. And Nat talks about what the experience was like riding this really wild horse and the fact that he stuck in the saddle and got a job as a cowboy. He drove cattle from Texas, New Mexico, all the way up to Dakota Territory. In his book, he says that when he was in, De in Deadwood, South Dakota, uh, it was an interesting experience. He was there on July 4th, 1876. And when he got there, they were having a July 4th celebration. Uh, and competition. He got involved in that competition. He said he won the competition, and after that, they started calling him Deadwood Dick. 
The term Deadwood Dick is a popular term that a number of writers have used from time to time, but that's uh, how Nat Love describes himself again uh, as Deadwood Dick. He lived a life after that and did a number again of interesting, interesting things. This is an interesting fellow too. He looks pretty fearsome there with his guns uh, tucked in his waist like that. Uh, his name was Ned Huddleston. That was his name initially. Uh, uh, but during the Civil War, uh, he became an orderly for a Confederate officer. That means that he traveled with the officer during the war uh, and from time to time provided food for the officer, which sometimes meant taking food that was not his to take. He became very good at doing those kinds of things. When the war is over, he gains his freedom. Uh, he decides that taking things without asking for it was uh, maybe an interesting way to live. Uh, he became a horse thief uh, in the Texas and Mexico area. Uh, and of course, everyone knows what happens if, you, uh, if you're a horse thief in the Old West and they catch you, what do they do with you? Uh, they hang you, that's correct. Now, if someone stole a car today and they got arrested, they wouldn't execute them. They just put them in jail. But remember, the horse was considered to be a lifeline to life itself. That uh, if you took someone's horse uh, and it, in the wrong situation, that person could die. So it was considered pretty serious. Anyway, uh, Ned Nettleson, again, basically, Nettleson basically is a horse thief. He's involved in those kinds of activities. Uh, it gets pretty hot in that region, in other words, the law and things like that. So he leaves that area and moves up to the Wyoming, Colorado area. And there, again, he falls in with a bad crowd. Now, I would advise you young people today, stay away from bad crowds. Uh, the bad crowd he fell, in, fall in, fell into with was a, a gang called the Tip Galt Gang. The Tip Galt Gang was involved in stealing cattle and horses up in that region. Uh, and it's something that caused uh, a number of the cattlemen some dismay. They didn't like the idea of their cattle horses being stolen. And so what happens is they set a trap for the Nip Tip uh, Galt Gang, uh, and they ambush him. The only thing is that uh, Ned, again, who's going to change his name to Isom Dart, by the way, uh, after these incidents, uh, is basically a few miles away from the gang at the time because one member of the gang had been injured and Ned was doctoring on him, and here's the shots, and later on goes and finds that every member of the gang has been killed except him, and of course the guy he was doctoring also died, uh, and of course he after that begins, become, takes the name Isom Dart. As Isom Dart, living in the area of uh, uh, the Browns, uh, Browns uh, the area of uh, Browns Hole up, up that way in Colorado, Wyoming, uh, he basically does a number of things. Uh, he gets a ranch, uh, he also, again, does a little stealing, cattle and stuff like that, which almost everybody in the area did. Uh, was not unusual for them to be involved in that. Uh, and so much so that the cattlemen, once again, are so upset with him that they send a deputy from another community to come and arrest him. He arrests, again, Isom. He takes him to jail. He's on his way to jail. The wagon turns over, and Isom basically, uh, again, the deputy is unconscious. He straightens up the wagon, puts the deputy back in the wagon, and goes into town and turns himself in. And when the trial, the deputy comes and speaks again for Isom. Says, well, this is a good guy. I was unconscious. I was laying out there. He picked me up, brought me in here. He's not a bad guy. They say, well, you can go. Let him go. Well, he goes back to his home area there. Uh, the cattlemen are still upset with him. But this time, rather than sending a deputy, they decided to send this man here. Tom Horn. Tom Horn had quite a reputation. Uh, he had done many things in life, but what he was, became known for was a gun for hire. A gun for hire. A paid assassin. Large cattlemen, quite often cattlemen, would, uh, would hire uh, uh, Tom to come and take care of troublemakers. Troublemakers were people who they thought were stealing their cattle or anybody that was causing them some problems. So Tom Horn comes up to the area. He changes his name to Tom Hicks. He pretends to be just a cattle buyer, et cetera, et cetera. But he's gaining information about at least some of the folks who had been part of the folks stealing cattle. One of the folks stealing cattle, of course, was, again, Isom Dart. Now, Tom Horn had an interesting practice. What he would do 
When he would find someone that had been sort of targeted to be killed, he would like put a note on their door saying, get out of town or else. Now, not everybody wanted to leave town. Uh, Isom Dart definitely didn't want to leave town. He liked the area, et cetera. Some of the other folks that he had targeted, that uh, Tom Horn tar tar targeted, we also didn't want to leave town. <coughs> and so, in the case of Isom Dart, Isom Dart basically stays in town. He tells some friends about it. They come around to kind of protect him. But again, what made uh, Tom Horn such a, such a powerful figure was that uh, he wasn't going to meet you in the middle of the street and have a shootout with you. He was going to use his rifle and he could be 100 or more yards away, shoot you, and kill you. And that's exactly what he did. He killed Isom Dart. So Isom Dart, again, became, fell victim to, uh, again, uh, again, to uh, Tom Horn's activities. By the way, Tom Horn, in that particular image there, again, is, uh, he, he, in that image there, he's in jail. He's in Cheyenne, Wyoming. He's in jail there. He's about to be hanged. But he's not being hanged for Tom Horn for killing uh, Isom Dort. He was accused of killing a young boy named Willie Nichols. Willie Nichols, again, is the son of one of those small ranchers that was causing trouble uh, and apparently came out of, the, of his dad's house wearing his dad's coat and hat and probably was killed by mistake. Tom Horn never, ever admitted to killing Willie Nichols. Uh, and he may not have killed him. He may not have, but he was hanged for it. Uh, and he was hanged for it in Cheyenne, Wyoming. His body was taken to Boulder, Colorado. I've actually seen Tom Horn's grave because I spent time in Boulder. He had family down that way. Uh, and that was the end of Tom Horn. But again, Tom Horn was uh, definitely someone who, uh, again, who did kill, again, uh, Isom Dart. That happens to be a Buffalo soldier. I was talking about Buffalo soldiers before, uh, black men who, uh, become part of the standing army for the first time after the Civil War. They've been fighting for the United States from the very beginning, but now part of the regular standing army, peacetime army, uh, and the black men that uh, served in the American West gained that moniker of Buffalo Soldier, which they adopted uh, and took it with some pride. Uh, this is, oops, uh, gone too far. Now, this is an interesting fellow too. His name is Bass Reeves. Bass Reeves is a deputy U.S. Marshal. He works out of Arkansas, but the territory next to Arkansas, Oklahoma Territory, Indian Territory, that region there is kind of like a no man's land. A lot of outlaws out there, that's where outlaws would go and hide, et cetera. And so his job as a deputy U.S. Marshal was to come into the office, get the warrants of people who were to be arrested. He traveled into, uh, Indian Territory, Oklahoma was now Oklahoma, in that area there, and would arrest folks and bring them back for trial in Arkansas. He worked for a judge named Isaac Parker. Isaac Parker was known as the hanging judge because he hanged more men than anybody, uh, any other federal judge in the nation. In his 20 years or so of working as a deputy U.S. Marshal, uh, again, Bass Reeves was never wounded, never shot, even though he was shot at a number of times. Now, what's something interesting about Bass Reeves, too, is that he could not read or write. So he gets these warrants, and he's got all these people's names and descriptions on it, but he has to find someone who's going to have to read that to make sure that he brings in the right person. They said in all the years there, very rarely did he ever bring in the wrong person. He'd take the person wherever he needed to go to in order to verify this was the person and then bring them back in. But Bass Reeves, again, worked as a deputy U.S. marshal until Oklahoma became a state. Then he worked as a deputy in Muskogee, uh, Oklahoma, for a few years uh, until he was an old man. But quite a resourceful person. Of course, when he went out to arrest someone, he didn't walk around with a big star on his chest. He disguised himself in various kinds of ways. But he becomes, again, an extraordinary figure. There are those who have even said that it was the life of Bass Reeves that may have motivated the story of the Lone Ranger. That's at least one story out there. But he was a very interesting person. A friend of mine, Art Burton, did a book called uh, The Ebony, uh, Ebony, I think it's, uh, it's uh, not Ebony Gun, but he wrote, he wrote a biography on Bass Reeves that's very, very interesting. Uh, again, I think it's Black Gun, Silver Star, but uh, Bass Reeves, a very interesting and fascinating person. There are black women in the West 
not just black men in the West. This is a Clara Brown. Clara Brown had been a slave in Virginia. She travels out to Kansas. Uh, and during the time that she was a slave, uh, her family was separated from her, and she was particularly trying to connect with a daughter. And quite often, her travels were associated with trying to find her daughter. She's in Kansas. Uh, she's washing clothes. She's making a little money there. But she wants to go out west because she thinks her daughter might be out west. And there's some miners that want to go out to the Colorado, Denver, Colorado area. And they were willing to take her along if she would cook, which she did. She got out to the Denver area, and she began to wash clothes. Uh, and save her money. Still looking for a daughter, but she was very, very provident. She saved her money very, she was a very resourceful person. Uh, and you can see the way she's dressed there indicates that, again, she's not extravagantly dressed, but well-dressed for the photograph. She saved money, uh, she even uh, bankrolled prospectors. A lot of times prospectors would come in and say, well, uh, Aunt Clara, I think, I, I think I've got some gold out, I think I'm, I'm gonna strike it rich or I'm gonna hit do pretty good, and she would uh, bankroll them or grub stake them as the term was used. They'd go out and whatever they got, they'd bring part of it back to her, and eventually she becomes fairly well-to-do. But she used her money basically for philanthropic purposes. She helped churches to get organized, et cetera. She goes back to Virginia looking for a daughter. She didn't find her daughter at that time, but she helped about 15 or 20 newly freed African Americans to migrate out to Colorado, where they set up, set up the life for themselves. Eventually, she does connect, however, with her daughter. Uh, and uh, it's an interesting story. She was uh, so recognized, so well recognized in the Colorado area that she was made a part of the Pioneer Society, the first woman and first black to be so inducted. This is a woman uh, of quite of some renown. Her name was Mary Fields, and she was known uh, to the world as Stagecoach Mary. She's six foot tall, she weighed over 200 pounds, and she was known for being very, very strong. Uh, she had been working with some Catholic sisters in Ohio. She travels out to Montana, uh, where she continues to work for them, and she had a kind of a surly reputation and I guess her slurry reputation is what got her uh, sort of dismissed from working at the mission. There are all kinds of stories about her either shooting someone or gunshots and things like that. But in any event, Mary Fields couldn't work there anymore after that. And so she applies for a job as a stagecoach driver. Uh, a lot of men wanted that job. Mary Fields also wanted that job, and she got it. She's very, very good. She was very good, and she was known for being, again, adept at using the rifle as well as handling horses, et cetera. She did that for about 10 years. And then after 10 years, she resides in town. She has a number of little activities there. She is involved there, laundry again, things like that. What made her kind of notable, of course, uh, among other things, was that she used to bet cowboys that she could knock them out with a single punch. Now, if you've come in contact with cowboys, cowboys think they're pretty tough. Most of the cowboys I've met, and of course, some of them are pretty tough. <laughs> they are pretty tough. Anyway, they would stand there, and they would allow Mary Fields to draw back her fist and hit them with her fist. And she would do that with such force that she would knock them out. A buddy of mine was doing research on Mary Fields, and he found this quote. He sent it to me. He said, Cowboy Mikey, you're probably interested in this. He found this quote. He said, Mary Fields broke more noses in Montana than any other person, and she probably did. She had, again, a reputation. She was someone that was well-loved in the community. She was a person that, again, had a, a so he's bigger than life reputation. There's also a story about Mary Fields doing laundry for a cowboy who wouldn't pay her the money that he owed her. At one point in time, she sees him, and in town, she confronts him, you know, and apparently he gives her the wrong answer, and she knocks him down. She doesn't knock him out, and she puts her foot in his chest and uh, asks for her money, which he promptly decided to pay her. Uh, but Mary Fields is still a legend today. There are people who are writing about Mary Fields, um, books about Mary Fields. There are reenactors that do Mary Fields. And if you go to Cascade, Montana, you can probably find people who are still talking about Mary Fields. Again, quite an extraordinary uh, individual. I like this photograph. This is taken by a photographer by the name of Solomon Butcher, who traveled through Nebraska taking photographs. Uh, a lot of, again, settlers and homesteaders, et cetera. And he takes a picture of this black family. This is the J.W. Spies family. Uh, and what I like about it, it tells us a lot about what people were doing 
and how people were doing what's particularly African Americans. Now here is the, the prairie area of, again of, of uh, Nebraska, and you say, well, what are blacks doing out in Nebraska? Well, this family is getting decided to homestead out that way. What makes it kind of interesting about the family, I, see, I think that's a little pointer on this thing too, is that this family is doing well. And we know it's doing well because of uh, a number of things. The kind of house they have behind them is the kind of house you would, you'd build in Nebraska. It's called a sod house. A sod house is basically cutting out chunks of the earth uh, allowing it to dry and using it like bricks. And you can see this house basically is, again, sod house. That's sod. And around here, you see the wood frame. There wasn't much wood around. And so you couldn't build your house out of, uh, out of timber like you would in the east and places in the Midwest, et cetera. And that's how you did it. But what makes the Spies family kind of interesting is, first of all, look at the clothing that they're wearing. Well, you said, well, that's just clothes that people would be wearing if they were maybe having their photograph taken. Many folks, many of the photographs I've seen of folks living out in this area, they're wearing work clothes, not dress clothes. These are dress clothes. These are not the kind of clothes that you wear when you're doing your work. Even the little boys have dress jackets on. This is a family that is doing well enough not only to have work clothes, but also dress clothes. You can see, too, back here, that's a buggy. A lot of folks when they went to town, they just went in work wagons. That's all they had. The Spies family not only has work wagons, but they have buggies. That's like having a nice car in your yard. Now, let me ask you this, uh, all you sort of uh, scholars out there. What's this up here? What's that again? It's a windmill. That's right. You see the housing. In some of the photographs, you can actually see the, the wheel up here. But that's the housing for a windmill. And the reason, of course, windmills were so important is that the water is deep beneath the ground. And you needed a windmill to pull the water to the surface for both people and animals. Uh, again, and uh, that's what that's all about. Now, one other thing. Now, if the photograph, if the photographer is here taking the photograph, why is her eyes closed? Why is he? Look, why is his eyes that way? Why are people looking away? Look at the boys there. And actually, the people who are looking like they're looking at the camera basically have their eyes closed. Why is that? Oh boy. What's that again? No, it's not the sun. It's not the sun. When they're taking these photographs, they're using some very powerful chemicals and powerful flashes. And quite often, the photographer will tell people, again, to look away or things like that, because the flash is a very blinding kind of flash in order to create the image. And so uh, again, you can almost everybody there is either looking away from the camera or have their eyes closed. Okay, but this is again a family out in Nebraska, a black family out in Nebraska that's doing, doing very well. Oh, here we go. This is the most famous black cowboy of all times. Now, what makes you the most famous black cowboy of all times? You've got to do something pretty special. And he did. His name is Bill Pickett. And Bill Pickett, again, as a young boy, learned to do something that was quite remarkable. He learned how to basically, uh, basically what, the, what became known as a sport of bulldogging. That is, controlling a steer with just his teeth. Uh, it's believed that when he was a young boy, he saw a bulldog do that. And later, as a grown man, uh, he becomes a, rod a rodeo performer, rodeo star. Uh, and what he used to do is get on a horse, ride, and then let a steer loose. He'd ride out into the arena. He would grab the steer by the horns, allow the steer to pull him off his horse, bring the steer to a stop, pull the steer's head back, and then bite the steer's upper lip with his teeth, throw his hands out just like this, holding the steer in place with just his teeth. This was an amazing feat had not been done by any other performer before today. If you go to rodeos, you don't see anybody biting the steer the slip or anything like that. But you see what's called steer wrestling. And I've been at rodeos where they'll say, we're now going to have the bulldog or steer wrestling event. And the, and the originator of that event, Bill Pickett, a cowboy. Again, Bill Pickett, black cowboy. If you go to Fort Worth, Texas, and you go to where the old stockyards are, they have a giant sculpture of Bill Pickett wrestling a longhorn steer. Because not too far from that sculpture is the arena in which he used to perform. Uh, quite an amazing 
cowboy, quite amazing cowboy. He traveled all across the country. Uh, he worked again out of uh, Oklahoma, a ranch out of Oklahoma, uh, uh, out of uh, a rodeo out of Oklahoma. He traveled with folks like Tom Mix, uh, Will Rogers, et cetera, those old cowboys. But often it is, it's Bill Pickett that's the star, at least at that on those rodeo, because of this feat he could do. Uh, lived an interesting life, traveled abroad, did all kinds of things. That happens to be a motion picture that was made on Bill Pickett called The Bulldogger. Yeah, that, there, it's not full, it's just a few pieces of film left on that at the, uh, at the National Archives, but it was a mo motion picture made about him. That's, of course, the sculpture piece I was talking about. This is my last image, and I'm going to open up to questions if you have any. This is, again, sort of represents, uh, again, sort of the, the cowboy, the black cowboy. Uh, I remember there are black cowboys in South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Louisiana, Texas, there are black cowboys in a lot of different places. Uh, after, again, of course, we kind of think of the, the West as being the place where the black cowboys uh, or where cowboys are located, but they were located in a lot of different places. But one thing you can say about uh, a black cowboy, and one reason why folks chose that kind of life, there is a degree of independence in being a cowboy that you don't have in other professions. While black men were on the range in the West working as cowboys, their counterparts were often in places like Georgia as sharecroppers or, again, later during slavery, of course, as just field hands, where you, your work is being monitored, where people tell you, this is the time you get up, this is the time you go to bed, this is when you take your break, all those kinds of things. But that wasn't true even during slavery days for cowboy, cowboys, because a cowboy has to be independent, gets on a horse and rides away from the homestead, can be, gone a few, can be gone a few hours, even a few days away from the homestead. His work is, requires him to be able to make independent decisions uh, and not be told what to do. Because if you're on, let's say, a cattle drive and you see a steer's getting out of place or about to run, at that point in time, you've got to make a decisive action to bring those steers back. It could save your partner's life, another cowboy's life, et cetera. And again, a number of black men chose that as a profession. In some cases, they lived in a world, a Western world, where you might be on a ranch where you receive no discrimination at all, but at any point in time, you could go somewhere else and suddenly be faced with discrimination. So black cowboys didn't live an idyllic life, but for many, a better life than they lived in other parts of the country, and they chose to do that. There's still black men today who make their living as cowboys and enjoy the experience. Okay, I don't want to run over time. Uh, but let me just stop at this point and say, are there any, as you can bring the lights up if you'd like to, again, uh, and I will try to answer any questions that you have uh, about uh, blacks in the West or black cowboys, anything I've said so far. Initially, there were four infantry regiments that were basically uh, really reduced to tw tw 24th and 25th infantry. And of course, the 9th and 10th cavalry, these are horsemen. Uh, so you have really four, mainly four units of them. Infantry and cavalry. And after a while, it's kind of interesting about that. While it's the cavalry that gets the name of Buffalo soldiers, the 10th cavalry, for example, but after a while, all black soldiers were called Buffalo soldiers. The name just sort of permeated all black soldiers, whether infantry or cavalry. But it started with the cavalry, the 10th cavalry, and at, at a point, it becomes just the name that was referred to as Black Cowboys. Where did the Buffalo soldiers come from? Well, you know, some came, out, some came out of the war, Civil War, but many of them were, were folks who uh, uh, either just wanted to try a different kind of life, a different kind of lifestyle. They were recruited all over the country. You had folks checking and trying to get folks to come and join the military. And of course, one of the advantages was that it was steady. You got regular pay and things like that. And, uh, if you didn't mind changing your location, and many of the cowboys, I don't think, mind changing their, people who wanted to be soldiers, didn't mind changing location, that they, in fact, elected to do that. Let me mention one other thing, too, that's kind of interesting about uh, cowboys and even black cowboys. That topic has really gained a lot more sort of attention in recent times. There are a number of folks, particularly abroad, who are fascinated by the West and black cowboys fall under that. I was in Germany, uh, in Münster, Germany, a few years back, uh, and I, I, the cowboy image was no stranger to them because there's been a fascination with cowboys in Germany for a long, long time. 
uh, about a week ago, I was being interviewed by the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. They were doing a, a documentary on blacks and the, on black cowboys. They'd sent some reporters over. They were out in Fort Worth interviewing folks, et cetera, and they interviewed me. Uh, I was uh, at a radio station in uh, North Augusta being interviewed by the BBC. And so it's more than just national, it's international. A lot of people, again, various places are interested in uh, black cowboys and at least either rodeo or, or film documentations on them as well. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just an influence. I've, I've never really been a cow. I've spent time in the West, a lot of time in the West, and I like the cowboy life, but uh, at this point, so far, I've never really lived. But now, you never can tell. I'm retired. I might, you may say, well, where's Cowboy Mike? Can he come down to East Georgia State College and speak? No, I'm sorry. He's out in Colorado, or he's out in, he's in Texas, he's on a ranch somewhere, so he can't come down to speak. No, I've never lived the life of a cowboy, but I really do enjoy it. Uh, there's something really mystical about the West. I was talking to some black cowboys, I interviewed about 50 black cowboys, black men and some black women who, again, had lived at least 10 years of their lives as cowboys, uh, and talked to them. And one of the things you get out of it is that being in the West is different than being in the East or the Midwest. I've been in places in Montana, other parts of the West, where you could stand in one spot and see 360 degrees around you, nothing to mar your vision, no trees, nothing higher than your eyesight. And you could look out in front of you and see the sun, but you could turn around and see it was raining. You could see the lightning and, and raining. Over here it's cloudy. Over here it's it's sunny, four different weather formations at one time. Uh, and one of the cowboys I was interviewing said that when he traveled from uh, West Texas uh, down to into the Southeast Tennessee, he said, man, he said, I really felt claustrophobic. I felt kind of squeezed in because suddenly what was just landscape, just, just the world was right there in front of you, now is being closed off by trees. A funny story, I was talking to a, a lady who had lived out in, in the West and brought her kids to Georgia. And she was driving them down a country road, a uh, dirt road, not a, not a highway, and the kids began to scream, scream. The trees, again, were covering like the road. And it was so scary to those kids that they began to scream like they're being tortured. It's a different experience. And I think for a number of folks, the Western experience was just one that was just, uh, was just a very special, very, very special kind of experience. It really was. Yes. Yeah. Um, how do you define well, probably if you wanted to put that on your, uh, let's say you're paying your, your taxes, let's say, and it says what's your profession, and you put on cowboy, then you probably should be doing something around that activity. For example, there are people today who work at these feedlots, like I said before, and they move cattle from one lot to the next to the next to the next. They could define themselves as cowboys. There are folks who are rodeo performers, who basically, again, spend most of their time just going from rodeo to rodeo. They could define themselves as cowboys. I think that those are sort of strict definitions of cowboys. I think that uh, a number of people who are not, again, working cowboys, they're not rodeo performers, et cetera, sort of identify with the cowboy life. And uh, again, may spend some time in the West, et cetera. They're not doing cow work, but they just sort of like that like the sort of their, at least the image of what it meant to be a cowboy. But there are people, who, again, who could put on their social security, uh, on their uh, income tax form cowboy, who actually do that kind of work. And I've had a chance to meet, talk to some of those folks as well. I, I never found any instance of cowboys not being paid the same fare. Uh, you know, you might, now remember too, I never found any case, they already got paid the right, the same amount as, as white cowboys. Here was sort of the trick, of course, coming to a ranch. Most of the men who became cowboys after the Civil War were white Southerners. Now there's a sort of a popular notion that most of cow, black cowboys were black, they were not. Most were not black. On certain ranches, I've been on ranches where I've interviewed uh, black cowboys who said, on our ranch, 
the owner only hired black cowboys. But I've also talked to black cowboys and said, on my ranch, I was the only black cowboy. And if you move out into West Tech and other places, there are a lot fewer there. But one of the things, again, but, uh, uh, but black, uh, I'm trying to think of your question again in terms of, yeah, they got paid the same amount of money. But uh, one of the things that uh, you really uh, come into problems with is that on any given ranch, your experience could be quite different, as I said before. And that is, uh, since many of the cowboys were Southerners, they didn't always like black people. Some of them were very hostile and things like that, so you could come into really trouble. But in terms of pay, I, I've never found any discrimination in terms of pay. They got paid the same, usually a dollar a day, something like that. And they got provided with a, how, with a little bit some place to sleep and to eat and things like that. But that was pretty standard for cowboys. I was interviewing a black cowboy in southeast Texas. And I said, well, what days did you get off? He said, Cowboy Mike, we didn't get any days off. I said, come on. You know, everybody works a five-day week or a six-day week. He said, we didn't get any days off. I said, well, what did you say? Well, sometimes we just get mad. We just leave the ranch, go into town, get drunk, whatever, and then come back later on. He said, but no days off. I couldn't believe that, that you just had a schedule where you officially have no days off. You work every day. He said, yeah, that was the case. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's a good question. Um, ranch is kind of, it was kind of a, a sort of a flow to a ranch. A ranch might have a certain number of cowboys that were there all the time. But at certain times during Roundup, when you're moving cattle, et cetera, like that, they hired additional cowboys. So cowboys would come in at those peak times, do that particular assignment, and then quite often move on, drift on to the next ranch. That was riskier for a black cowboy than a white cowboy. And so black cowboys often, when they could, got a permanent job on a ranch. Because moving from place to place, you didn't know what the reception was going to be. Uh, but they were transient, quite often transient. Um, and it wasn't, you know, today we kind of glorify that life. It's kind of a, a romanticized. But it was hard work. It wasn't that pleasant. And I remember reading about a cowboy who was, again, off in a distance living. Uh, he was basically... Uh, taking care of cattle, but he was all pretty much alone. And uh, someone drove, came by, didn't drive by, rode by, and started talking. The cowboy talked endlessly, almost like nonstop, because he'd been so long deprived of any kind of human contact. Well, that's not every cowboy's experience, but if you happen to be in that situation, that could be your experience. Uh, but yeah, itinerancy was, uh, went hand in hand with being a cowboy. You worked somewhere for a while, you moved on to somewhere else. You worked there for a while, you moved on to somewhere else, yeah. Some place, yeah. They tended to be single, and they tended to be young. Cowboys were like 16, 17, 18 years of age, sometimes even younger. Uh, it was a rough life. Now think about this. You're on a ranch. You're going to be involved in a cattle drive. You could be on that cattle drive for the next four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, depending on how far north you're going. Uh, that kind of activity didn't lend itself to folks who wanted to settle down and live a more traditional kind of life. And cowboys tended to be fairly young. And when they got a little bit older, plus this too, uh, if you're a cowboy uh, and the weather's bad and the, and, the, and, the, and the herd is, again, restless, you might be in the saddle for 16, 18, 20 or more hours. Uh, you're sleeping out on the ground, uh, bad weather, whatever it might be. Uh, that's not something that, you know, old folks would like a lot in most cases. Maybe a few exceptions. Maybe a few exceptions. But anyway, most, most folks would, would like to live that, that kind of life. It's too rough. And so by the time you got to your 20s and mid-20s, a little bit longer than that, a lot of times they're kind of fading out. Or they make transitions. For example, a number of folks transition from being regular cowboys to becoming chuck wagon cooks. Uh, paid more money and you didn't quite have to live as rough an existence as, again, a working cowboy. And so a number of folks make that transition from being cowboys to Chuck Winkle, and the folks got out of it all together and began to do other kind of things. So, yeah, it was a young man's profession. Oh, Deadwood. Dead, Deadwood, it's a town called Deadwood, still there. Oh, oh, Deadwood Dick. Well, he said that he, was, he had this contest in the town of Deadwood. 
And after he won the contest, they started calling him Deadwood Dick. But the term Deadwood Dick is a very popular term. A number of Puck fiction writers will use that term, et cetera, et cetera. So you might find several references to it. But he said that after he won the contest, that's what they began to call him, Deadwood Dick. Uh, and that's how he referred to himself uh, in his uh, autobiography. Nat Love, and again, and Deadwood Dick is one of the names he, he calls himself. Yeah. Well, we do appreciate you coming today. Okay, my pleasure. My pleasure.